Okay, I'm not seeing anything yet on my end. Is that normal? Uh, if anyone, if anyone is listening, I can't see anything yet. I'm, I'm hanging in a vacuum here, but this is a drawing. This is a drawing. Oh, okay. Well, I guess I will, I will just. I will just start to talk, and uh, and uh, other people will, will hear me and see me. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, this is we're having a sort of a, a little art art hour here, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my process. Um, now, what, what we have here are three versions of the same drawing. Um, and this one here, which looks like pencil drawing, this is the original drawing. Uh, I have kind of a insect creature and some children afraid of it and a wizard in the background who's, um, he's a little, he doesn't have any pants. So he's covered up there with a piece of tape. Um, this is a family, family show. Um, and this is kind of where I start. This is uh, like my pencil drawing and I start here and this is what I would have sent to the client to say to him, you know, here are the, the things that you requested. You know, these are uh, the, 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 the creatures and everything else. And then they say, okay, uh, this looks right and that looks wrong and can we change this? Uh, so, you know, since all of these things are for publication, they're illustrations, there's usually some dialogue back and forth with me and them. Um, and what I do is after I get the drawing approved, uh, it's just a kind of a rough, sketchy version uh, by the client. Um, then I transfer the drawing itself to another sheet of uh, art paper. Uh, so I, I use a digital process to print it on the paper. My original drawing, I print it on the paper in a very pale blue, like you can see in this one. Um, this is uh, a little bit different than I was doing just a few years ago. It just uh, gives me uh, another chance to um, ink it. Uh, and if I don't like the way I'm inking it, then I can um, start over. Uh, if I make a mistake or spill the ink or anything like that. Um, this one here that you see, this is actually just a printout from my inkjet printer, but I did it this way to show you how I intend this drawing to look in publication. So I'm using this uh, magenta ink I'm using for a gray tone. Uh, it's not going to be printed in magenta. I just I kind of like working with it because I can see more clearly where I've gone in with tone versus where I haven't. And I also just kind of like the way it looks. Um, but in the end, it will look more like this. So we started with this and then I got in here and I inked and I applied my tone and I even used uh, some, some of this white ink uh, in areas like this to bring in white areas where maybe I put in a little too much tone. And uh, then after I scan this, then it can be reproduced like this. And uh, so that is my explanation for what I'm doing tonight. Uh, so this is a big drawing that I'm working on now. And this is sort of the sketch here, you have kind of a city scene, and I have little places in here that eventually there's going to be text in there, but I have some beggars and criminals and other sort of residents of the city of Lankmar 
who are uh, uh, patrolling the streets there. And so now I'm going to get in here and start inking. So I'm going to go from this to, I won't get it all done tonight, but I'm going to get eventually to this. And so it will reproduce something like this. Um, and this is more or less my current um, procedure for, for doing this kind of art. Um, and I will uh, probably continue to refine it as years go on. But uh, in terms of when I get ready to ink, I use a lot of different tools. Some of my favorite ones are right here. I do have Pro White. Sometimes I use Pro White, and sometimes I use Dr. P.H. Martin Bleed Proof White. I have them both here. And uh, the, um, the only uh, difference I see between them is which one I grab first. I, I don't, they're kind of the same. I guess the, the Pro White is a little uh, easier. Uh, to ink over than the bleed proof white, but the bleed proof white gives me whiter whites. So I don't know. They're not that different, but they're different enough. Uh, one of my favorite pens are these Faber Castell Pit pens. Uh, I also like these Statlers that come in different thicknesses. This is the 0.5, and there are some smaller ones I like, like the 0.1 is usually the finest tip I use. I also like the pit pens, like the one that is F, I guess that means fine. And there's another one that is called S, that means small or super fine, I don't know. Um, and then there are also some that have what they call brush tips. Um, so I use, I use these a lot these days, but I also also really like the sort of classic I call it a dip pen. I've heard other people call it a crow quill pen. Uh, and I use uh, different sizes of brushes. Um, and those I use just to spread black ink. The, um, the paper that I usually draw on is called uh, Bristol board. Um, and uh, the theme board is kind of confusing because it's more like paper. Um, these pens are not erasable, um, but you can always use white. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons why I, I do this printing out in blue, uh, printing my sketch out in blue, is because if I don't want the blue in the drawing, uh, I can uh, select it after I scan it and just uh, replace it with white or something else. Usually I don't bother with that because it kind of makes a nice sort of background detail. Uh, and I can also go in here and do this. I started doing this instead of inking directly on top of my pencil drawings because sometimes I press too hard on the pencil and it kind of makes little divots in the paper. Um, and then the ink doesn't apply as well. Uh, so that's why I started doing it this way. I know some other artists use things like, um, they use like uh, tracing, you know, like uh, uh, transparency tables to ink on top of, but I can't imagine that would be very easy because uh, you kind of have to sit in the dark and ink in the dark, which is not, not my idea of a good time. But as you can see, these pens, this one works just like a little brush. And I can go right in there. I'm, I'm kind of just diving in. I found a little spot where I want to do some thicker blacks. And, and what I'm going to do tonight, um, I'm going to try to move this up so it's more in your field of view, for those of you watching at home, is I'm going to just try to ink in this area um, normally I try to sort of move around the drawing and not work on any one place too much. 
um, you know, kind of try to build it up as I go along. Uh, but but tonight I want to do in one spot more, just so in the hour or so that we have, um, we can sort of see that part of the drawing tape take shape. So I'm gonna I have a, like a guy here with a a hood on his head and a drum and a sort of a banner. Uh, he's some sort of insane cultist, I guess. And so I'm going to try to ink him in in the time that we have. Um, and uh, yeah, you'll see that. Now, I don't know, uh, Thorin, you you guys who are listening at home probably can't hear Thorin, but is this going to be like, can I watch this later and see how I did? Like, am I going to be able? Okay, so this will be streaming later and I can I can cringe as I okay okay this will be later on the YouTube channel for Goodman Games I'm sorry for those of you who are calling in but I cannot hear you uh, and if you are saying something to me uh, Thorin will read it and then I will reply if you are saying something by text or whatever it, it is um, yeah. So, um, so yeah. This is if you're curious. This is this is more or less how I spend my nights uh, and days um, uh, in being a artist for Goodman Games and other role playing game uh, companies and. Other things, um, my life in the pandemic has not changed that much. I know for many people, it's been, it's been terrible. But for me, it's less bad simply because I work at home in my own little room and I don't usually see people like if the mailman comes and <laughs> I see him uh, but that's about it um, you know which is okay I like it uh, I like kind of this kind of quiet usually I listen to music and uh, or I listen to podcasts those are nice things to listen to as long as it's not too distracting because you got to concentrate a little bit. One of the um, ways in which I've really kind of developed my artwork is that I use these these different size tip pens in a series. So I can go in there. I was drawing this with the one that is called F and this is S you can see there. And so S, which I guess is super fine, is only slightly finer than F. And if you draw them right next to each other, you almost don't really see the difference. But when you start getting in there, then after the drawing is, you can kind of see that the, the new lines I'm adding are just a little thinner, just by a little bit than the other ones. And that can go in with an even thinner one and sort of I gotta find my really thin one. Okay. 0 0.1. And I can kind of put little these little lines in there, you know, where I want to kind of show uh, the turn of the fabric as it wraps around his head because he's wearing this who is that guy on Fat Albert, you know, who wore the hat that came down over his eyes and he had like holes in the brim? I don't remember his name, but that's who this guy is modeled on. He's kind of a masked freak, I guess. Uh, Outbeat out is dumb Donald. Thank you. Was that you, Thorne, or did somebody... Somebody else offer that up. Oh, quick with the quick with the information. Um, 
but yeah, uh, so these. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so yeah, and then after I do this for a while, then I'm going to go watch the political debate. Um, uh, how long? I, I, um, it's something that I'm still working on. Um, so I don't know if I'm, I am. And it's something where I have done a lot of things, like you got to do it badly a lot before you can start doing it better. And I still sometimes mess it up. So that's why I kind of like this method where if I really screw it up, I can just throw it out and start over again. Um, but I think I've, I've been trying with cross hatching for a long time. It's, uh, it's, something I guess I'm kind of interested in the way that it it um, helps sort of describe the shape of things and stuff like that. Um, trying to remember the name of the I, I, I got a book a while back and the artist who wrote the book it's it's mostly about drawing with ink. Um, he's from the Dominican Republic, but I can't remember his name right now. So buy the book by the guy from the Dominican Republic, and that'll help you a lot if you're curious about cross hatching. Um, but you know, you kind of want to, with, with things like this, um, the, 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 the thing that makes my cross hatching better, the thing that makes my cross hatching easier is if I don't try to do it all at once, you know, I kind of like come in and, and sort of, sort of, uh, first you start by sort of defining the different shapes of things, right? So we've got like this, this muscle on his arm here and that curls around, right? So it's, 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 it's round like a, like a ball, you know, this, 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 uh, muscle of the arm. Uh, so, you know, then I kind of start shaping the lines to that. Like these are where the hat curls around his head. You know, really you're, you're, you're just trying to give the thing shape and form as if it were being struck by light. Um, which usually when I mess up the crotch cross hatching is when I don't think of it in terms of a shadow. I think of it more in terms of a pattern uh, uh, that I'm just kind of filling the drawing up with. That's kind of when I usually make my mistakes. Um, one of the things I'm hoping you can see here is how much of the actual drawing process kind of occurs in inking. Um, and this is something that's probably different for different people um different artists uh there are some uh artists like um I'm trying to remember his name uh the jack kirby like his pencil drawings that he would start with would be really detailed um like surprisingly to me i i i wouldn't have bothered to do that much detail in the drawing um than he did, but I think that was because he was often just drawing the pencils and somebody else was helping him with the inks. Uh, I'm not really sure how they do that, but. Yes, how, how did you find that? Okay, yeah, that's that's the exact one. I, I, I it, it is a very good, um, you know, he has all these lessons in the book and I didn't do them all and I really should. Uh, but yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a really good for, for whoever was asking earlier about cross hatching. I think that was a really good guide. I mean, when I was in art school, which was a long time ago, I did have some drawing classes where we did some of that, but 
really it's sort of practice, but the, the Alfonso Dunn book had really good sort of uh, lessons in it. And uh, although I'm not very good at doing homework, um, I did do some of the lessons in there and they actually helped a lot. Um, yes. Well, I, I, I good. I, I, I'm glad somebody else is getting something out of it because uh, I really there's a lot of drawing, but I'm not a I'm not into art education. I don't know a lot about it, but there's a lot of books out there that are just I, I don't think that they're very good. I think they're kind of frustrating as they sort of give people you know, sort of impossible goals, you know, you kind of got to build up to doing things, learning how to do things by, by trying and maybe sometimes failing, you know, maybe too much failure isn't good, but a little bit of failure is, you know, maybe necessary. I don't know. Um, anyway, um, these kind of these pens, I didn't used to use these kinds of pens. I would, I would advise uh, people to make sure to get pens that claim that they are um, archival, uh, because some of the pens will, will kind of, if you draw on a piece of paper, they will um, eventually you know, make the paper rot away if they're non-archival ink. Um, you know, like, like, like those smelly magic markers, I think most of those are um, actually not, not good if you want your drawing to last uh, past the point where you're, where you're dead. Um, I mean, maybe it'll last a few years uh, beyond your normal lifespan, depending on your habits. I don't know. But yeah, so this is more or less the life of the artist. I guess if I keep doing these, I should also do one where I show you the pencil process, but uh, I just decided to do this one because I had this one going and I was kind of eager to get to it, to be honest. Um, a lot of the ideas for these kinds of drawings, they come from, you know, like other illustrations that I've seen. Um, there was this guy, a uh, British guy in like the 18th century. His name is Hogarth. And he made all these political cartoons about London and, you know, whatever was going on there in the 18th century or whenever it was that he lived. Um, and he has like, Really nice crotch cross hatching. I almost called it crotch hatching. Um, and I, I kind of feel like you you learn a lot by looking at other people who have, you know, kind of kind of look at at their drawing and kind of figure out, okay, well, why why is this good? And uh, one of the one of the reasons I admired the Hogarth drawing is that he had like all these, every, every little line that he put in there, it all had like a purpose, you know, it kind of described the shape of the, the people and, and his drawings were also, um, they were made for reproduction. And I guess at the time, they were using kind of printing printing methods that they couldn't print tone. They could only print line. So in order to make a tone, 
the artist had to create a false tone with these little little lines, you know, like a woodcut or a mezzotint. Um, that that you know, it's actually from a distance it looks like tone, but up close you can see it's it's either black or it's white in there, you know. Um, I think they call that relief printing, you know, because it's based on the on the surface that's used to print it, you know, like the high parts print black and the low parts don't print at all, so they're white. And you know, that's how you make the the um, the uh, image pop out. It is not. Uh, sometimes I tape the paper down. I use, um, there's something it's called artist tape. And you, you normally when something is called artist this or artist that, it, it, it's maybe kind of silly, you know. But in this case, I would definitely recommend, you know, the stuff they call artist's tape. Because one of the good things about it is that it doesn't tend to tear your paper when you pull it off. Um, I mean, you can you can tear your paper if you're careless, and I frequently am kind of I'm too eager, you know. I want to pull off the tape and look at it, and then it uh, and I end up tearing it. But yeah, the the artist tape I would definitely recommend. Kind of that one. That's a it's something that is like regular masking tape is not as good uh, as the artist tape. And the artist tape just looks like masking tape, but it's white and it's less sticky. So uh, as far as tape goes, it kind of sucks, you know, because if you're trying to tape up a box or something, it doesn't really work. But for this, it's perfect. Um, Yeah, so, you know, this is more or less what we do here. Um, one of the things that I'm going to do eventually with this drawing is I'm also going to go into um, using colored inks on it. Um, and for that, I usually use, you know, these, these inks, um, which will reproduce as gray. But they'll give that kind of thing, and I can I can dilute that with water. Um, but one of the things that I try to do is I try to get most, if not all, of my inking with the pens, whether it's with these little Statler pens or if it's with the India ink or the brush. I try to get all that done before I go in and do the tone work. Um, and my reasoning for that is that sometimes the tone work um, will kind of smear the other stuff around, which I want to I want to be under control of that, you know, the, the, the kind of the, the muting or the graying of colors. And I found it's it's much better if I kind of go in a logical order. And my logical order is uh, black ink and then colored ink. And then if I'm going to use it, um, the white stuff, I also sometimes use, this is called gouache. I guess it's a French word. Um, it's like a thicker watercolor paint. Um, uh, but this is not waterproof, so you got to be careful, right? So if I go back over this with uh, another wet medium, it'll it'll dilute it, it'll mix it up. Um, and then sometimes I also use graphite, which either is um, in a you know just an ordinary pencil form, or I also have used uh, you can buy you know, cans of graphite. Uh, that are for artists where it's um, it's like a powder 
and you can kind of smear it around or you can mix it uh, with other media and you can kind of get you know further gray tones and just different kinds of um, effects I guess I would say because uh, it's it's nice to have a lot of tools in your toolbox in that way and I didn't used to use all this tone in my work um, but I saw a lot of other artists working in it and you know they kind of expanded my definition I used to have a very small definition of what a drawing was and uh, I kind of enjoy broadening that idea um, and using you know these different other uh, tools I guess would be how I would put it um, yeah so here you can see I mean if you take a closer look at the Let's see if I can do this in a way that'll, is that too blurry for people to see? Probably looks a little blurry from here, but you know, I'm, I'm like trying to get in there and, and sort of give people, I mean, give things and the people in the drawing a little more definition as I go along. Um, and I also, I tend to do a lot of sort of adding details as I go along, you know, that, that aren't in my original sketch, which is kind of, oh, right on. Thank you. I was, Thorin just told me to move the picture. I was, I was drawing off screen, which isn't terribly interesting for you to watch me. Hi, Bradley. How are you tonight? Probably at home working. Bradley McDevitt is this guy who you doubtlessly know from Goodman Games. And every day he's on Facebook and saying, just finished another job for Goodman Games. He's a machine. He's one day I aspire to work as hard as Brad, get as much done. Of course he is. I just um just did something for that. I don't remember. Oh, it was it was portraits of some of the some of the people in the um, the Temple of Elemental Evil. Yes, yes, it was portraits of some of the uh, NPCs. I did just a few a little while ago. I was obsessed with the uh, Temple of Elemental Evil when I was a when I was a youngster. I um. I'm old enough that um, we had that that uh, Gary Gygax published *The Village of Hamlet*, and then something like I don't know what it was like eight years or ten years or something went by before. So all we had was the first half of the adventure, and uh, and uh, they kept promising the second half and it just never came <laughs> so we had to make up our own temple of elemental evil which i just took the title literally i was just like okay they're evil elementals right and so i had this uh, this god who was you know part fire and part water and part air and part earth right and he had four arms and uh, four feet and 
Yeah, that was my idea. It wasn't very good. <laughs> yeah, you know, I didn't quite work out how how that worked, you know, him being an elemental evil, you know, like he's made out of, you know, water and fire at the same time. Wouldn't that, wouldn't he like put himself out, you know, kind of, I don't know. But, yeah. So this is, you know, more or less the life of the artist. I usually don't talk while I work, so that's kind of weird for me. Like it's not bad, but it's it's not what I usually do. And then I feel like I'm talking to people, but I can't really hear them, so that's kind of weird. I mean, I'm not very good at talking anyway, so, so, uh, life in politics. I do, I do not. Actually, um, my partner Annie is always catching me talking to myself. And I'm always very embarrassed when she catches me. And then she says, well, it's okay. I know you do it. I hear you all the time. Um, but yeah, it's kind of embarrassing. Um, so I don't think the voices are really in my head. I mean, they're coming out of my mouth, but I'm just sort of talking to myself like, oh, look, it, it, it looks like a little drummer boy. Or, you know, I'm saying just like stupid things that that are embarrassing, you know, because. Yeah, so one of the things that I've been working on uh, recently um, is trying to make sure that I take absolutely as long as I need to with the drawing. I, I really, I feel some regret um, that I, I used to spend a lot of time sort of worrying about my level of productivity, uh, where I wanted to get stuff done. And I think that the work suffered because of it. And so one of the things that I'm trying to do these days, um, especially during, uh, this plague time where where we don't have excuses to go anywhere is I try to just take as much time as I think I need and then uh, the other thing that I do is that I try to well, see I'm always dragging it towards me here I'm going to solve this problem by taping it down let me just grab some I'm going to grab some artist tape because otherwise it'll just keep happening. So I'm going to, see this is the artist tape. It just looks like, just looks like um, masking tape, but it's a little less sticky. Um, I am not, uh, I was, that's the word I was looking for earlier. I was uh, talking once to an artist. Um, he works in a very different style than mine. His name is uh, uh, Durf, John Backdurf. Is it John? I don't know. His name is Durf. Uh, his, his real name is Backdurf. He's the guy who did the um, My Friend Dahmer comic book. And I don't really know him. I just, you know, he's a public figure. And somehow I uh, 
managed to talk to him once by, I think it was email, uh, where he said that he does all of his drawing on a light table. And I tried it. Um, you know, they sell these light tables uh, from the art supply store, and now they're really cheap. They're these LED, very thin light tables, and you can get them for, you know, um, you know, 30 or $40, and they're just, they're fine, you know, they're, they use like LED lights inside of them. I don't know how long they last, but, but they work really well, but I just found it, I found it impossible because I had to like stare into a light while I was drawing and it just, it didn't work for me. I don't know how he does it, but some people do that. Um, Brad, if you're still there, do you ever draw on a light table? Mez, do you draw on a light table? Um, I'd be curious to know how it works uh, because it, it would be a way you could, um, you know, one of the things I'm doing this for is I'm trying to avoid tearing up the paper with my pencil, you know, so I'll, I'll draw with pencil but then I'll scan it so that it's very flat um, and the paper is very smooth, which is how I like it uh, for my inking and other, you know, if I add tone or uh, draw on top of it. Um, That's the word I was looking for. Those are the ones that are, they're really thin. So they're convenient. I used to have a light table that was like six inches thick. And so my arms were like sore from being on top of it. But I really only, I used it for, like I, I used to use it for um, mapping, you know, when I had to draw all the little 10 foot squares and stuff like that. Um, but I found better ways to do that. So I, I, I don't really use it very much anymore. Um, uh, so, yeah, you know, some of these things you kind of, as I go along, I like see things like this. This one leg here to me doesn't look right. So I'm going to try to fix it while I ink, I think his knee is too far down. So I'm going to try to move his knee up. And hopefully, I will do a good job. Um, but that's like one of the ways in which I like it as a kind of a, a process of refinement. You know, I'm not just tracing the lines I made before and making them black because um, that's kind of the way I used to do my inking. You know, like I, I, I would really follow the pencil and, and, and I think, you know, they're like, you can always make a drawing better, I guess. Um, and that other way, I was just making my, my, uh, you know, whatever mistakes, like, see, I think that leg looks better than it did. It's not perfect, but I'm going to work on it. So I am, but it's taped down now. I can't do anything about it. So I'm going to go up here. I'm going to draw. Oh, wait, maybe I can move the camera. There we go. Is that better? That's not too crooked, is it? Um, I just have my, my camera suspended over my desk on a little pole, so I can move it around. Um, toes are one of the hardest things to draw correctly. Um, 
in my opinion. But the hardest thing in the world to draw and make it look good is a horse. That is, that is my undeniable truth that I'm presenting to you tonight. Um, which doesn't mean I shouldn't try to draw it correctly, but kind of gives me a little bit of a nightmare whenever I have to draw a horse because you can find lots of pictures of horses um, for reference. And I do use uh, 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 reference drawings for stuff like that, but somehow I think people who grew up around horses probably have an easier time drawing them because they are they are complicated creatures. Well, all right. I'm not sure that's going to happen. I don't. I don't want my shame to be seen by all. See me struggling with drawing a unicorn or something. Um, <laughs> I was going to draw a frog tonight, uh, but then I decided to do this one. Um, well, Hectophonic, I love uh, frogs. I, I, I think they're among my favorite creatures. I live in my neighborhood. There's like a little, um, there's like a storm drain that I walk past every day. And there are these frogs that live in the storm drain that when you walk past it, they all jump in the water and swim away. So that is my big excitement for the day is me and my dog go down there and try to see how many frogs we can startle. Do uh any of the people watching, do you have favorite artists for drawing? I can tell you that some of my favorites, I'm not sure that these in count for drawing, really, but the printmaker, Albrecht Durer, he's kind of one of my favorites. Um, I think he's another good person to study um, cross hatching with, um, kind of, yeah, I certainly know Virgil Finlay. I'm less familiar with Brahms line work. I mean, I certainly know all the work he's done in fantasy in, in painting over the years. All right, so Mr. Mr. Um, I don't know what to call this guy. He's a announcer. Uh, yeah, sure. Town crier is good. Um, He's out there making his announcements. Sort of. I don't know why he's wearing a mask. Maybe he's self-conscious. But um. No, it's it's not a. Well, these these people are they're not following quarantine guidelines. 
but you know, I mean, he's walking around in the city in his bare feet. He's he's got no regard. This is not for Lankamar. This is this is more of a, a personal project, although it is Lank Lankmar inspired. So I guess the answer to your question is yes and no. Um, now parts of it, like this part here, is going to be, it's a two-page illustration. And this is going to be in the gutter, right in the middle where the pages come together. So this part is all going to be black. You know, it's sort of like the wall between the two halves of the drawing. Um, so imagine all of this thing that I've just sort of filled with scribbles is really going to be um, just all black. Uh, yeah, so we've got this. Nasty old woman here. Now well, maybe she's just sad. I don't know. Wearing some kind of weird bonnet. Um, You know, and one of the um, things I try not to be uh, scared of is, is I try to remember that I can hopefully, if I'm not happy with something, I can fix it. But sometimes you get to the point where fixing it, you know, you just... You can't. So you also have to be unafraid to start over. I think I used to be sort of stubborn about not wanting to start a drawing over again. But sometimes it's actually less work and you get a better final result if you're just willing to quit and start over. Um, I usually allow about a, a, a quarter inch is sort of my um, thing, but I I draw much, I usually draw larger than it's going to be reproduced. Uh, so a quarter inch probably it becomes closer to about an eighth of an inch. Um, yeah, which once you, like I scan it and then I size it down, like it's going to be on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and, and um, you know, maybe I draw it so it's like 16 inches tall or something. Um, yeah, so it's probably somewhere between a quarter and an eighth of an inch by the time I scale it down. Um, but that is actually a very good question because I often try to leave a little more because I'm never sure where where it will end up getting cropped. You know what I mean? That, that's something hard to predict. So if I have something important, you know, like this guy's face here, um, I really don't want that to be too close to the edge where who knows if it's going to get trimmed off. Um, so hmm, I think I, I'm answering this question very badly. 
<laughs> I gotta leave. I gotta leave more. I gotta leave more uh, of uh, than I've done in the past. Uh, one of the things I like to do is when I start working on things that are a little further back, I try to remind myself not only to use some lighter lines, but also to kind of make things maybe a little simpler if they're in the background. And sort of the idea of that is, is kind of the idea of uh, what they used to call atmospheric perspective, where things in the distance will be a little less distinct just because uh, there's smoke or, or vapor in the air, you know, so something that's solid black when it's further away might appear dark gray instead. Um, You know, so with this, I, I would want to avoid getting as, you know, like I'm probably going to work on this drum here a lot more, but I don't want to get this barrel, which is something like 10 or so feet away behind the drum. I don't want it to be as highly detailed, you know. Uh, maybe just a little vaguer in its treatment, and that hopefully will help move it back a little bit in space. Um, but that's something I don't always succeed in. Um, it's sort of, I guess, going on my list of life goals is to get better at that sort of atmospheric effects in uh, drawing. Okay, well, let's well, my, my, my partner here tells me I'm running out of time. I don't know what's up next on on uh, on Goodman Twitch, but I hope you've enjoyed tonight. Uh, in a little bit, I'm going to go watch the presidential debate. Um, take a break from drawing. I did a lot of drawing today. Um, do we have any any more questions, statements before I go? Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm I'm not this isn't normally a, a spectator sport, so it's kind of kind of interesting for me to do this. I don't know if I'd do it every day. I'd probably get a little self conscious, but yeah, we'll do it again. Maybe we'll draw a frog next time or a horse. Maybe we'll draw a horse. Maybe I'll start from pencil next time. So you can kind of see my, my full process. And we'll do a less involved drawing that's just going to be a horse. Um, yeah, so, you know, this drawing will probably take... Uh, 15 or 20 hours maybe to finish. I'm not really sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of my process. That's my world. That's how it works. I thank you all for, for uh, tuning in, and I hope you have a good evening. And um, I guess we'll see you next time.